Well, so, I'm certainly pleased that you were available and willing to come back to, to be our speaker for today. Well, good. I get you. Is it time to get started? Are we, are we starting now or what? We are. I have uh, 30 seconds till 1230, but I think it's close enough we can start. So first of all, <laughs> the thing is people might, you know, not everybody needs to come to the SHREW meeting. They might just sign on for the speaker. So we want to respect that announced time of 1230 to start our speaker program. Can't hear you, um, I've already mentioned, if you have a question for Dr. Bowles, please put it in the chat line. And then when he finishes talking, we will, uh, we will recognize you to ask him your question. But go ahead and put your questions in the chat line. I already mentioned you can speak, uh, switch to speaker view if you want to just watch Dr. Bowles. And I would like to just take a minute and introduce Dr. Bowles. Not that he needs much of an introduction. I think he's one of the most well-known and popular professors at Rice in probably, I don't know, the last 10 years. He is the William P. Hobby Professor Emeritus of History. He earned his bachelor's degree from Rice mm -hmm. in 1965, and he got his doctorate from the University of Virginia in 1969. He joined the Rice History Department in 1981. Uh, I first heard of Dr. Bowles because as an undergraduate, I had a work study time at the Journal of Southern History, and I knew that he took over as editor later on after I had left. And he also served as president of the Southern Historical Society and the Association. That must, must be interesting now, given everything going on mm -hmm. with in Southern history. He, uh, I, let me just mention, I'm, I first met Dr. Bowles in person because like a lot of you, I went with him on one of his trips. I was lucky enough to snag a place on the last Lewis and Clark trip, which was fascinating. And then I went with him on his Jefferson in France, one of his Jefferson in France trips. Wonderful trips, and I think a lot of us alumni know Dr. Bowles and love him because of all the trips he's gone with us, gone on with us over the years. He, um, his, his previous book was Jefferson, Architect of American Liberty, which came out in 2017. And he retired to our great sadness at the end of academic 2019. But we see he's still with us, even if it's all alone in his carol in the library. Um, over his years of teaching, he directed nine, 63 doctoral dissertations, 63. And of his students, uh, somewhere I read this online, his students have written more than 50 books. Wow, what an influencer he has been. And uh, as I already mentioned, he bailed us out by agreeing to be our speaker today. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bowles. Over to you. Okay, good, good. Well, I, uh, my topic today, as you know, is it's, it's called, I'm calling it Nation Makers. It's about seven Virginia men who played a disproportionate. What? You can't hear me? Ann, can you hear me? We're, we're good, I think we're just in background noise. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna just keep talking then. So uh, when I finished my uh, Jefferson book, uh, as soon as I, I mean, actually before I got, you know, there are only, when you write a book, there's a lot, you have to go do book signings and that kind of stuff. So I was quite busy for the first year of traveling around. But within a month or so, the editor of that press said, what's your next book? And I, and I said, well, I, I don't really have a next book. I, I haven't over this one yet and he kept about every three or four weeks he would keep calling me and saying have you decided upon another book and uh so i was sort of uh i guess i would say hurried or pushed to uh choose a new a new title and um i had been thinking for a long time it had occurred to, actually it occurred to me even when, when i was in graduate school at university of virginia uh it, it, i was amazed how many influential people came from a really tiny area of Virginia and turned out to be, I thought, vastly disproportionate in their influence in American history. And so uh, I began thinking about, since I was being pushed to choose a title, choose a topic, to think about doing a kind of a, I'd almost call it, call it a composite biography of uh, people. And so I decided to choose seven men 
all of whom were born within about a 30 year period within a region of Virginia that's less than 100 miles in diameter. And these people are, and this is in order of when they were born, George Mason, who was born in 1725. I have to say George Mason is not very well known today, but in 1765 or so, he was incredibly eminent in Virginia. And many people thought he was the most sophisticated constitutional legal thinker in Virginia and uh, was a man of great influence. So anyway, George Mason, born in 1725, and then George Washington, and then Patrick Henry, and then Thomas Jefferson, and then James Madison, and then John Marshall, and then James Monroe. Four of those guys become president. Uh, Marshall is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for 35 years, and his role in American history is at least equal to that of being president. And then uh, Mason and uh, uh, Patrick Henry played a really important role in the coming of the American Revolution. These seven men all lived within a tiny area of Virginia. They all knew each other. They all corresponded to each other. And they uh, played, as I said before, uh, just an amazing role in American history from the before the coming of the American Revolution to the mid 1820s when you could say that the American system of government was really established. And so I was thinking about how could I do, how could I write a history of Virginia, not so much of Virginia, but write a history of the United States using the lives of these seven people sort of intertwined as they came into and out of the story to use those lives to tell the story of the creation of the American nation. And I also realized that while sometimes they all agreed with each other, for example, the coming of the American Revolution, they were basically all on board, but they ended up uh, becoming, a, a, ha, ha, representing a wide variety of viewpoints. In fact, you could almost say that every major political viewpoint of the early national period represented by these people. And some of them become real enemies. And uh, so I, I was, that's what I was thinking about. And just at that time, I remembered in, uh, 19, in 2009, right after Obama had been inaugurated as president, my son David, who lives in London, took a cab in London, and a cab driver, recognizing he was an American, brought up the topic of Obama's being elected. And this man looked at David and said, you know, nothing like that could happen in this country. And David told that to me, and I, began, I was thinking about that in 2017 and 18, as I'm mulling over this new book. Nothing like that could have happened in, in this country. And I thought, is that true? Are we that unique as a nation? And in 2017, 2018, I began to think, how could these seven men, what, what were their ideas what were the institutions they created? What, were the, what was the system of government that they created that in fact made possible? I mean, it's true that it took 200 years to take, make possible, but to make possible the fact that a black man can become president of this nation. Uh, so I decided to write about these people. Now, what I liked about it, since they all were, I actually had, had been to all the, I knew that area of Virginia very well, and because of my work on Jefferson, I knew a lot about, I sort of knew a lot about the story before I started this. But these people were all articulate and they all wrote letters. And all of them except Patrick Henry, uh, their letters are collected in multi-volume sets. So there are hundreds of volumes of letters of all these people. Jefferson's letters alone are like 70 volumes. And uh, Madison, Monroe, and Marshall, and Washington were incredibly prolific. So you have these seven uh, very articulate people who wrote a lot, who knew each other, and I could follow their lives and I, through the whole time. So that's what I decided to do. And so I, uh, I began really in the 1740s. And I, at 1740, if you kind of think about colonial Virginia, Virginia was the oldest of the colonies. It was the largest of the colonies, and it had by far the largest population. And it was the richest of the, of the nation of colonies. 
And in 1740, if we could have gone back to visit them, that they thought they were living in a golden age. There was no idea. They, no one foresaw a revolution. They were pretty well off in the British Empire. They had guaranteed markets for their major crops. Uh, the, the sons of the elite who were educated at home by private tutors, or maybe at the College of William Mary, would go to London to be finished off and maybe become a lawyer. And uh, the wealthiest uh, planters were building beautiful mansions along the James River and other rivers. It seemed like for them that was the absolutely golden age of Virginia. But we can now see in retrospect, there were already things beginning to happen in the 1740s and 1750s that are gonna emerge and are gonna kind of blow up as problems. And we're gonna see this kind of unusual thing that a colony whose wealthiest men, the most elite, the most established, are going to become the radical leaders. It's kind of unusual because you don't usually think of really comfortable, wealthy people being radical political leaders who are willing to risk everything not only their 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 uh, income and their houses and their all their assets, but their lives, in, in pursuit of a cause. So uh, that sort of sort of curious to me. So I began to look at the, slowly the kind of evolution of problems that began in the late 1740s and the early 1750s. And sometimes these are very very minor problems. I mean, for example, in the 1740s, Virginia had passed laws willy nilly over you know, more than a century. And some of these laws were uh, 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 no longer needed, and some of them, were, were, they were repetitive, and some of them were uh, uh, not very clearly written. So the idea was, why don't we sort of go through the body of the laws of Virginia and sort of clean them up and uh, cut out the ones that are no longer necessary and make some of them uh, more, more detailed and more effective. So they just sat down and they sort of redid the laws of Virginia. And they thought, well, that's an accomplished thing. And they just sent a list of all their redone laws to England, thinking nothing of it. However, the Board of Trade in England always had the authority to approve or disapprove of any laws passed by colonies. They just never had bothered to do it. And it never occurred to the colonists in Virginia that the, the Board of Trade might do that. But the Board of Trade had suddenly gotten um, uh, you know, more attentive to their duties. So they actually looked at these revised laws and uh, accepted a lot of them and uh, canceled 10 of them and sent about a dozen and said, redo these. And the colonists were just astounded. I mean, wh what business does the, what business do people in England or London have to do with uh, uh, making us rewrite our laws? I mean, it's always been there a right, they just never done it. And then a few years later, they've, they've been on the law for years that the Anglican ministers, remember the, the established Church of England, and taxes paid the salaries of the ministers. And the ministers were paid in pounds of tobacco. Everything in Virginia was based on the growing of tobacco. So the salary of the ministers for years had been 16,000 pounds of tobacco. Then all of a sudden there was a shortage of tobacco and the price of tobacco per pound skyrocketed, which all of a sudden meant uh, the, the pastors got, uh, in effect, huge raises. And the colonists thought, well, this is not fair. I mean, the colonies ministers are making out like bandits. So, uh, as, you know, the, typically the price of tobacco was two cents a pound. So let's just adjust it down. So let's pay them the equivalent in, in tobacco now. Some of the ministers took them to London and said, this is not right. The law says we should be paid 16,000 pounds of tobacco. If tobacco has become more valuable, you know, that's God's grace to us. And uh, the Crown said yes, the Crown uh, uh, disallowed those, but it wasn't clear what uh, was that was this law that readjusted their salaries, was that to be retrospective or only from the time forward? And so several local ministers took the uh, Crown to to, uh, to trial. And one of those men, one of the minister, one of the ministers, James Murray, uh, he, the lawyer facing him was a relatively unknown young lawyer named Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was an unbelievable orator, and he wasn't particularly learned, uh, but he had a, a really musical way of talking. People always described his musical language, and he, he spoke very colorfully. And he knew how to raise his voice and to lower his voice. And he, he used, I mean, he was almost like an actor. And this is one of the time when most people spoke in a relatively formal way. 
Patrick Henry spoke in a way that just absolutely hypnotized people. And he, and he, he had he did put on such a trial of oratory that even though technically speaking, the ministers won, they won a, a payment of one twelfth of a penny. So really it was a loss. And then so Patrick Henry becomes a star. He's a young man standing up for the rights of poor farmers against these wealthy Anglican uh, ministers. And there, there are a series of little acts like this. I mean, not, you know, overruling some of the Virginia laws, uh, the dispute with the Anglican minister. No one of them seemed to be very large, but they began piling up. And slowly by the 17, late 1760s, Virginians are going to believe that there is a sort of a conspiracy afoot in London against the liberties of Americans. There, in fact, wasn't a conspiracy afoot. It's just that Americans began to see that, feel that. And once they thought that, then every, you can say almost every innocent act that the Crown did, the colonists interpreted those acts through the kind of uh, spectacles of expecting uh, a plot against their liberties. Another thing that caused Americans to become uh, aggravated is in the 1750s, these younger, uh, the sons of wealthy planters would go to London to study in the ends of court to become a lawyer. And they were, they had the finest clothes and they were the absolute elite of colonial America. Then they got to London and they discovered that the London elites, the real elites, they looked down upon these uh, uh, Southern elites as sort of country bumpkins. I mean, we don't, we, we had to realize that, uh, well, a, a mansion along the James River, uh, on one of my trips to Virginia, we remember we went to three of those mansions, like Middleton Plantation and Westbury. Uh, you know, the Middleton Plantation has maybe 15 or 20 rooms, and it was a big house in Virginia. But an Elizabethan house in Virginia, in, in England, would have 250 rooms. And so the scale of aristocracy in England was just astronomically larger than America. So these young Americans who felt they were on the, you know, sort of the top of the pecking order, they get to England, they realize they are, they're kind of put down as kind of country bumpkins. This makes them feel, they become annoyed at these uh, English aristocrats. In George Washington, in the, 17, in the early 1750s, there began to be squabbles between French uh, settlers in the Midwest and, the, and Virginians over who owns that land. And the Virginia claimed all the land, basically from Virginia to the Pacific Ocean. But the French began moving down from Canada into what we would call the Midwest. And they began claiming some of that land. So the, the governor of Virginia didn't really have an army, but he chose this young 21-year-old uh, uh, military man, George Washington. And I go into high in the world, as it turned out, that a 21-year-old man, George Washington, is named the chief Virginia military man. Anyway, he goes out to, to uh, mid the Midwest in Western Pennsylvania to tell the French to leave. This is Virginia territory. And the uh, French just rebuff him. And uh, out of that series of tit tat and battles back and forth uh, becomes, becomes the, what we used to call the Great War of Empire or the French and Indian War. Now, the result of this war is that the British are going to send, you know, thousands of crack British troops to the, to the North America and the great battle is going to be in, the, in Canada. But, and, and when they come, George Washington wanted to join the British military because in his early 20s, he now had, he was now the most uh, vaunted military authority in Virginia. And so he assumed that he would be made a general in the British army and would serve beside him. But the general, the, the, the uh, leaders of the British army, they just looked down again at George Washington. Who's this country-born Indian fighter, you know? They said, well, you can, you can sort of serve him for free. You can sort of watch. That really annoyed George Washington. In fact, he knew how to fight the Indians better than the British did. And his, his uh, well, he, not only was he, become, he was he very annoyed with British arrogance, but he also saw that the, these so-called crack British troops weren't all they were supposed to do because they, they lost against the Indians time and time again. But anyway, George Washington has become, become a, great, a hero in Virginia and is going to become the sort of primary military man in America by the time he's in his, uh, by the time he's 30. But 
these little acts, I mean, George Washington was really annoyed at the arrogance he met among the, with the British officers. Those young sons in the inns of court in London were really annoyed by the arrogance of British aristocrats. The Virginia legislatures were really annoyed when the border trade over, overruled some of their revised laws. The ministers in, in Virginia were very annoyed on the controversy over their pay. All these things are building up and it's gonna climax in a movement increasingly in the 1760s, but when the Americans begin to move away from the British and begin to develop an argument that they are not uh, second-rate British citizens, that they have all the rights as if they lived in England itself. Now, George Mason is uh, relatively quiet in this time, but he, he is, among other things, he is becoming a land speculator and uh, he writes a series of papers thinking about the political rights of, uh, of uh, Americans, saying that they have all the rights as if they still lived in England. And uh, Patrick Henry had continued to increase his fame in several talks when the, against, against the British, he became uh, a hero. He became sort of the voice of the, of the revolution. And George, uh, Thomas Jefferson recalls standing in the hallway of the state of the Capitol building there in Colonial Williamsburg, Williamsburg and hearing Patrick Henry speak. And Jefferson said he spoke as Homer wrote. And the others said they had never seen a human who could speak the way he could, that he could make everybody believe in his cause. And Patrick Henry at this time is going to become the most radical in support of American Revolution. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is uh, much younger. Uh, George Mason, for example, was born in 1725. Jefferson's born in 1743. So Jefferson is a very young man. Jefferson is elected to the House of Burgesses in 1768. So as, he's, he's, as a very young man, he's beginning to see the kind of developing uh, opposition between the colonies and the mother country. Uh, I don't have time to talk like this to go through all these things. In my book, I do, but you can sort of pile the evidence up so you can show that in 1750, Virginia was very confident and very happy to be a part of the British Empire and proud of being a part of the British Empire by the late 1760s and early 1770s as a result of this cascading number of little irritants. The colonists and the mother country had really come to disagree with each other. This, in some sense, comes to a head when the colonists decide to put together what they call a Continental Congress. Still, there are 13 colonies. There's no sense of, there's no sense yet of an American Revolution, but the colonists are beginning to believe that in different reasons, for different purposes, the different colonies had, were, were aggravated at the Crown, and primarily the Parliament, and they thought if they uh, let Parliament know why they were upset, that Parliament would make, break back down. And uh, there, there were a series of acts that you know from high school, you know, the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and so forth. And several of those acts that are passed, all of, went, met, met, all of which are intended to raise revenue for the Crown. Now, this, the raising of revenue for the Crown, for the colonists, has become be going to become a huge issue. We think of it in the phrase, no taxation without representation. But from the British viewpoint, the British could not understand why the Americans were so opposed to paying taxes. I mean, the colonists as a whole, they paid some local taxes, but the taxes they paid to the British Empire were totally insignificant, totally insignificant. And the colonists had felt threatened by the presence of the, of the French. And so the colonists had, had uh, exulted in 1763 at the end of the French and Indian War when the French were sort of defeated and now there was no longer a foreign enemy, the colonists thought, to their colonies in North America. But England has spent a lot of money in defeating the French. The English public debt had almost doubled. And England now had a much bigger empire that it had to administer. And it had to have forts on the West to protect against Native Americans and so forth. And so the, and the English people were pretty heavily taxed. And so the people in England began to say, you know, we have spent all this money making the colonists safe from foreign enemies. And we have to protect them against Indian attacks. And we're spending a lot of money on them. And we're already taxed a lot. 
and we've doubled our, our national bur uh, uh, debt. And they pay almost no taxes, so why shouldn't the colonists pay some? Why don't they pay just a portion of their share of the taxes? And so they decide they'll start passing a few laws like the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act that they think will be mild taxation. Surely they will agree to the sensibility of, and the fairness of that. But the colonists had never paid any taxes yet, and they uh, began to protest. And they began to protest that they, it, they said it was unfair for a government to pass a tax on people when the people had no uh, right to comment on the taxation. And England had a view of representation that they call uh, virtual representation. That is, in England, the members of parliament did not represent any precise geographical area, but every member of parliament represented virtually all of England. And so the English believed that anybody who was an Englishman, he was virtually represented in parliament by the members of parliament. But in the new world, they had gotten people had gotten accustomed to very strong local government and county government and county sheriffs. And particularly in Virginia, people believed that, you're rep that a representative represented only constituents in a precise geographical area. So the Virginians not having, there was nobody from Virginia elected from a district in Virginia in Parliament. So from the Virginia viewpoint, they were not represented in Parliament. From an English viewpoint, everybody in the colonies were represented virtually in Parliament. And so when the Americans said, we're being taxed without representation, British said, certainly you're represented. And they're just simply talking past each other. All these little issues began to grow and to grow and to grow. Finally, in 1760, 1774, Virginia elected delegates to send to the Continental Congress that was going to be meeting in, in, in uh, Philadelphia. Jefferson uh, was, thought he was too young to, to go, so, but he, he wrote out what he was going to be a speech to the delegates of Virginia, in, in some sense, empowering them to represent Virginia. He actually got sick and wasn't able to go to Williamsburg to try to give his talk, but he sent notes of his talk on, and the people read his notes and decided without asking him to publish it. So Jefferson's first publication is a very famous pamphlet called Some Review of the Rights of British America, and it laid out in incredibly eloquent language and in very vivid, hard-hitting language the ideological and the intellectual rationale for the colonies being free and independent of Great Britain. I mean, this you read it today and it's amazingly eloquent. It was Jefferson's notes for a talk. I mean, it wasn't even his, even his polished writings. But that pamphlet is going to be republished up and down the up and down the colonies, and it's going to be republished in England, and that is going to become the sort of central rationale for the American Revolution. And it's that, it's the fame of that pamphlet. A summary view of the rights of British America, 1774, by Thomas Jefferson. That's the reason Jefferson's going to be elected to the second to the Continental Congress in 1776. And by that time, the differences between the mother country and the nation and the colonies become so powerful that the colonists had gotten ready to vote as, on a resolution that said these colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent of any connection with the mother country. That is, they were going to vote on our Declaration of Independence. But there were a lot of legislators there who were not quite ready to go so far. So the idea was we will we'll wait a month before we actually pass this and we'll put together a committee to write out a justification or a rationalization for why it's time for us to declare our independence. And so they put together a, a committee of five this committee of five consisted of uh, Benjamin Franklin, the most famous American, who was quite old and quite sickly, John Adams, the most respected constitutional scholar, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston, and this young 33-year-old Virginian, Thomas Jefferson. They all knew Thomas Jefferson because they had all read that 1774 pamphlet. Adams, Jefferson is humble, and he thanks Mr. Dr. Franklin ought to write, the, or, write it, or John Adams. 
Franklin's too, too sick, he says. And Adam says, look, I'm, nobody likes me, he says. I'm too cranky. And so, but he, but he says, you should write it because you should be a Virginian to write it. But also, as Adams later said, Jefferson had what he called a peculiar felicity of expression. A peculiar felicity of expression. That is, Adams knew Jefferson could write like an angel. So Jefferson's these five, it's this committee of five, Jefferson sits down on a little slant desk that one of his slaves had made for him. He writes out the draft of the Declaration of Independence. And you know that you know how it begins. It begins with this really eloquent kind of philosophical language. And uh, right in the first sentence, it says something about when one people, when one people, you know, this, so far these are 12 or 13 different colonies. Rhode Island didn't pay much, it's kind of obnoxious. But basically it's 11 or 12 colonies are playing an important role. And they hadn't yet considered themselves a nation. But in the first paragraph of the Declaration, Jefferson imagines all these colonies together constituting one people. In some sense, he sort of intellectually creates the concept of a nation. And then he writes out, you know, those famous words we all know. And then it's going to conclude with a philosophical paragraph at the ending with a rousing conclusion. In between, the great bulk of the Declaration of Independence is a long series of terrible things supposedly the king and parliament have done against the colonies. And we read that as sort of uh, silly and it's really not very fair. And it seems like it's kind of a bad history. What Jefferson is doing there, though, is he sets up in the very first paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, governments are created by a people to secure their rights and liberty. And if the government they set up fails to secure their rights and liberty, the people have an obligation to overrule that government and change it. So after setting up that sort of philosophical argument, logical argument, then he wants to list all the different ways, give all the evidence for the ways that the king and the parliament have not fulfilled their duties of, of uh, defending the liberties of the American people. Now, it's not, very, it's not fair history. It's a very biased history. But Jefferson here is acting, writing as a lawyer. He's not writing as a neutral historian. He's writing as a, or a lawyer. He's arguing the American case to the jury of the world. And he's marshalling all the evidence in the best way he can to make the case that the American colonies have a right and a duty to declare their independence. It's an incredibly powerful argument. Actually, after Jefferson writes it, the committee makes a few very slight changes, and then it goes to the Continental Congress, and they spend several days going over it, and they cut out about 25% of the words, which really drive Jefferson up the wall. And they cut out a long paragraph. Jefferson had a long paragraph attacking the British principle of sending, taking, stealing people, men and women from Africa, depriving them of their natural rights and turning them into slaves. The second, the Continental Congress cuts that paragraph out because the delegates from Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia won't, won't have it. Jefferson is very upset about it because Jefferson believed that slavery was wrong. And that, and the Declaration of Independence had a long, powerful attack on slavery. That's eliminated. But the Declaration finally is approved, and as you know, is voted for on July 4, 1776. So meanwhile, the Continental Congress has already created an army. And, it ha and then when they got ready to create an army, it needed to have a commanding general. And John Adams knew that it was essential that since Virginia was the most biggest colony, it, was, it could not be seen as just something Massachusetts and Boston versus England it had to get all the colonies together. So it was important that a Southerner be named general of the, of the uh, Continental Army. Washington expected it would be him. I say like he expected because he came to the Continental Congress wearing his military uniform. I mean, it's a kind of a sartorial advertisement. Here I am. And so Washington was named commander in chief of the army of the United, of the second continent. And, and Washington uh, is not in terms of military strategy. He's not strategically speaking, a particularly good general, but he was a man of incredible character and incredible virtue. And he believes powerfully in the American cause. And he so embodied the American cause and he had such physical charisma 
that George Washington, in some sense, gives this, this weak little militia army the power to uh, uh, overcome incredible hardship and the shortage of food and clothing and the weapons and uh, uh, the wherewithal to kind of hang together until slowly, because of French aid and French soldiers and so forth, the Americans are able to de de defeat the British. I mean, it's a very interesting story, and I spend a lot of time talking about this. Wa Washington is, again, is a person who, in terms of military genius, is not a particularly skilled officer. But there's something about him. It's his charisma. The way he stood for the cause, the way he emboldened everybody to stick with him. And, and you read about, I mean, the, it's almost astounding that these colonies, as weak as they were, were able to defeat the greatest military power in the world. And they had no army. I mean, Washington had to create the army. And he had to convince the colonists to pay taxes and to send supplies and money and soldiers. And I mean, like in Valley Forge, the people there, it's cold, it's snow on the ground. They're living in little huts with no with mud floors. The, the soldiers are bare feet in the snow. I mean, it's an somehow Washington is able to hold them together. And it's an incredible story of, of how charisma and leadership is able to overcome all kinds of adversity. So I tell the story of the fighting of the revolution and the win. And then of course, at the same time they put together a committee to write the declaration, they put together a committee, a committee to kind of create a government that would tie these colonies together into a nation. And they finally in 1781, the colonies agree upon, ratify, a form of government called the Articles of Confederation. They fight most of the revolution without a real effective national government. Finally, in 1781, uh, they do ratify the Articles of Confederation. It's in October 1781 that the British are defeated at Yorktown, the kind of final great victory of the American Revolution. But the Article of Confederation turns out not to be a very effective form of government. You know all of this from high school. You know, the, uh, the chaos and the economic shortages and so forth. And I spend a lot of time talking about this and how all the people who had been involved in the revolution and had realized how, how much a shortage of money had limited their ability to find an effective, to create an effective army, they're among the ones who are most willing to kind of create a new form of government. And, the, and actually fighting in the American military itself had been a very nationalizing experience. And, uh, Jefferson is very much a part of that. However, Jefferson, uh, after the American Revolution, and I talk about Jefferson as being a wartime governor of Virginia and what a calamity that was. And then in 1784, Jefferson becomes the, the primary member of the Article of Confederation Congress and pushes through a lot of important legislation. And then he's sent to become ambassador to France. So Jefferson's going to be in France between summer, summer 1784 and the fall of 1789. So Jefferson is not involved in the writing of the Constitution. Turn my phone off here. I get the phone call about twice a day from people all the United States who are trying to get me to buy uh, extended warranty on my car. I mean, I, I, if I, next time I buy a new car, I'm going to make them promise to me that they never try to sell me some extended warranty. I mean, I bought this car because it never would need repair. And so... Uh, Anyway, uh, in 1785, 1786, under the Article of Confederation government, the U.S. began to uh, have an economic dis distress. Uh, there was an agriculture bond that no longer had guaranteed access to the markets of England. The local legislatures are doing all kinds of pork barrel legislation. There is unrest and uh, farmers in Massachusetts rebel, so-called Shays Rebellion. It, for a lot of Virginians and a lot of Americans in 1786, it looked as though the Article Confederation Cong Congress nation was going to collapse into chaos and misrule. There really was a sense that this is an age of crisis, that the nation is, after fighting the revolution, we're going to just dissolve into chaos. Jefferson's not aware of that because he's in France. But slowly there begins to be a movement in, in the Virginia. And here, this is where Madison and uh, is going to play a very large role. Madison is very young. 
but he had he studied in the 1780s he studied every form of government created by men at least europeans to, to sort of have self-government rather than monarchical government and madison is going to be sort of the brains of what we think of as the, of the constitutional convention and i'll go into great detail about how all of, out of all this economic chaos marshall and washington uh, not marshall george mason and uh, george washington and madison and then with hamilton from new york and from benjamin franklin and uh, wilson in pennsylvania and governor morris in pennsylvania there begins to be a movement to create a new form of government that at first they thought just to revise the article of confederation but Mar madison and hamilton realized they had to go a lot further than that so they push and they get the article of confederation government to call for a convention to meet in uh, Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to consider revisions to the Article of Confederation. But as soon as they get there, Madison and Washington and, and George Mason, they've been plotting in a sense. And they realize they've got, they, they need, you need a whole lot more than revision. You really need a new government. So they get the committee to decide they're going to talk in secret. They'll shut the doors so they can, they can be, be bold in what they think and not be worried about uh, public opinion. And so for three months there in Philadelphia, a, a, a total number of 55 men. And it's an amazing group of 55 men who meet in Philadelphia. And the odd thing is the two greatest, in some sense, government thinkers, John Adams is an American ambassador to England, Jefferson's American, is in France, though neither Adams or France or Jefferson are at the Continental Convention. But here, day in, day after, they began to hammer out, how do you create a government? And it's fascinating because Madison, and I describe in great detail how they work, and that, you know, Madison sits by himself on a little table, taking sort of his own form of shorthand, taking notes on everything that was said. And then that night, he kind of fills out a ver full aversion. So we have from Madison's notes, practically a verbatim uh, account of the debates. And you see these men, usually about 35 or 40 are present. Day in, day out, they begin to think about how do you put together a government? How do you control political power? How do you, what's the right, correct amount of, uh, of uh, democracy and uh, what is too much democracy? Do, should you have one leader or several leaders? There's a fear of monarchy, but you need a president who's got some power, but not too much power. How much, how much power is just right? How could, how could a president be chosen? Could, should you have should the people should the people choose a president? George Mason, for example, is very skeptical of, of popular election. He actually says asking the people to choose a president is about as stupid as asking the blind man to make a decision about color. And so they they figure out they actually come up with a with the electoral college as a sort of a way to sort of kind of have a popular election of a president. And they deal with all kinds of things. What is the power of the legislature? What is the what? How should the power of the legislature and the judiciary be be controlled? How how can you control the power of an executive? How can you prevent the executive from becoming a a, a monarch? C should the executive be impeachable? If so, uh, impeachable on what grounds? I mean, you read you read the accounts of the debates, and it's uncanny how every every issue that we think about we have today they thought about. I mean. You actually, this lot, we went through an impeachment earlier this year. You, you, you feel like you could just take the lines out of their debates and, and show how they were thinking about the very issues we're talking about today. Anyway, after two and a half months, they do, they perform what Washington said, almost a miracle there in Philadelphia. They come up with a short document that, just, that is the Constitution. It's an amazing document. Then, of course, it's, it, but it's just a document. It's just been approved by these 55 men. It hasn't been approved by the people. And so all the different colonies, now states, they put together ratifying conventions, and they elect delegates to these ratifying conventions. And so for the next year and a half across the nation, there are 13 different rat, uh, ratifying ratification meetings, and they have a total of 1,700 delegates, and they meet for days and days and days and days. Virginia again has the most uh, had the largest delegation and has the best records. We have three volumes of the verbatim discussion of these debates. And the level of competence, the level of knowledge, the civility, it's an amazing 
It's like the whole state and the whole nation became off almost a political science seminar. And in Virginia, the great debate became George Mason had played a very active role in the Constitutional Convention, ended up refusing to sign it. Madison, of course, had been almost the father of the Constitutional Convention. Washington was the person who held the colonies together and was the most respected man in America. He chooses not to be, be a part of the ratifying convention, although everybody knew he wanted to ratify the Constitution. Patrick Henry had become, while he was a radical in the 1770s, had become such a localist, he was opposed to creating a nation. He thought maybe three nations, a southern nation, a middle colonies nation, a northern nation. He, was a, he refused to go the, to the Constitutional Convention. He said, quote, I smelled a rat, so he refused to go. So at the Constitutional Convention, you have Madison and Edmund Randolph for the Constitution. You have George Mason and the great orator Patrick Henry opposed to it. Mason said, I would rather cut off my hand than sign this Constitution now. And so for weeks and weeks in Virginia, you have this amazing debate between Madison and John Marshall and Edmund Randolph with Washington in the background versus the mind of George Mason and the oratory of Patrick Henry. It's an incredible debate. At the end, Virginia the passes the ratification, ratifies the Constitution. And then finally, nine states do. The new nation begins. Who's to become the first president? Obviously, George Washington. He's elected unanimously. But he realized, George Washington realizes, they all realize the, the, the Constitution is very vague. A lot is left undone. We've got to, in some sense, create a government. Madison is right there in Philadelphia beside George Washington. And so Madison becomes George Washington's number one assistant in the first session of Congress. And that first session of Congress is almost as important as the Constitutional Convention. And uh, as I said somewhere else, you know, Ma Madison uh, writes George Washington's inaugural address. And then the Congress sends a letter of congratulations to Washington. And in the Congress, Madison is asked to write Congress's letter of congratulation to Washington. And then Washington asks Madison to write a letter back thanking Congress for their letter. I mean, that tells you how influential Madison was. And so for that first session of Congress, they actually create the Department of State and the Defense Department and the Treasury. They create the judiciary. That, and, and Washington and Madison also understand that everything they do is setting a precedent. So that first Congress is really important. And then, of course, they, once the government's underway, by now, Jefferson's Secretary of State is back in France. And uh, they began to sort of create the government. And they create methods of paying taxes and the excise tax. And they, are going to create the bank. And I go into a great deal of detail about the nitty gritty of actually putting together a government and all the debates that come up over this. And here you begin to see the real differences begin to develop. I mean, Patrick Henry had been opposed to the Constitution, thought it was too strong. Marshall thought it was too strong. Washington wants it to be really strong. Hamilton believes the Constitution is too weak. Hamilton would have much preferred the kind of a monarchy. And Madison and Jefferson are totally opposed to monarchy. And so you, Jefferson and Adams, Ad, Madison are going to really feud against Hamilton. And you can't understand the kind of dispute between Adams, John Adams and Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison without understanding how deeply Jefferson was opposed to monarchy. Because Jefferson just spent five years in Europe where all the great nations, Italy and France and the uh, Russia, Spain, the Habsburg monarchy uh, were, were ruled by great monarchs. And Jefferson was totally opposed to monarchy. So that, the fear of monarchy is going to be a huge issue in the 1790s. And out of this, this fear of monarchy and debate over economics, it's going to be the rise of political parties. I spent a lot of time talking about the rise of political parties. And Madison and Jefferson are in some sense turn out to be although they're opposed to parties, in fact, become the people who create the modern party system. And then there comes the election of 1800. The election of 1800 is going to be the first election in which the political power is going to shift from one political party, what we call the Federalists, 
the administrations, the two administrations of George Washington and John, one of John Adams, the shift to Thomas Jefferson. And that election of 1800 is an incredibly bitter election. And the Federalists accuse Jefferson of being a deist and an atheist and a French radical, and he will destroy the American nation. It's a very, very disputed election. When the votes, electoral votes are cast, there's a tie between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> they weren't, the political parties didn't yet list a president and a vice president. The electors just voted, and whoever had the top two votes would be the president and vice president. Well, all of a sudden, you, there's a tie. And then the Federalists thought maybe we can, since it's a tie, we can void the election. Or maybe the Federalists say we can steal the election from Jefferson and we can choose Aaron Burr. Because Aaron Burr is the person talented but without principle. And if he's without principle, we can manipulate him. And so all of a sudden, the Federalists began using their energy to throw the election to Aaron Burr. Hamilton hated Burr. He didn't like Jefferson, but he hated Burr. And so at the very end, Hamilton sort of comes to his senses and realizes that they cannot elect Aaron Burr. So he begins to throw all his energy into keeping Burr from being elected. After a dispute, after 37 consecutive votes in the House of Representatives, on February the 17, 1801, Jefferson is elected president. He is to become president on March the 4th, two weeks later. Out of this argument later, as you know, Aaron Burr and uh, uh, Hamilton are going to have a duel in which Aaron Burr kills Burr, Hamilton. But anyway, Jefferson now becomes president. There's no transition team. He has to uh, put together a government and write an uh, inaugural address in two weeks. He does it. And Jefferson, the, uh, Jefferson's first inaugural address is one of his most powerful arguments. It's an incredibly eloquent address in which he talks about the values that bind Americans together. He doesn't want to divide the America. He wants to create an American nation. He wants to heal the divisions. It's, it's an incredibly ironic, inspirational address to try to downplay the animosity of the election and create an American nation. Jefferson, it's, it's, it's an amazing piece of writing. Jefferson then is going to become a very effective president. People thought he might be too dreamy, too philosophical but he's a very, very effective politician. One of the ways he is such an effective politician is every two or three times a week, he has about a dozen people come to the president's mansion to have dinner, <clears throat> and Jefferson serves the food. This is in Washington, D.C. is a brand new little town, miserable little town, so the, the, the congressmen and the, and the senators don't bring their parent wives. They just come and live in a boarding house. So they're living day after day after week after week in boarding houses, eating monotonous, greasy boarding house food. And then once a week, maybe they'll be invited to Jefferson, to the president's house. And Jefferson has amazing French food. And they sit around a long oval table and Jefferson puts the food on the plate. But Jefferson doesn't just dispense the food. Jefferson is a sensational conversationalist. He knows everything. He's read everything. And he can talk to everybody. He has a very specific general way of talking, and he's able to diffuse animosities. He's able to make everybody feel important. He, makes, he, he, he says he understands that if we understand each other, we'll realize that sometimes little tiny differences get exploded. If we, can, if we know each other, we can, dis, we can diminish those differences. And so Jefferson is going to use his dinner table and his conversational skills and his French food prepared quote in Virginia style in his wine cellar to create a sense of good feeling. Jefferson is going to become an extremely effective president, and he creates the role of the president of having an agenda. Washington and Adams had seen themselves as sort of, in some sense, figureheads for the nation. Jefferson sees himself as a person with a political agenda. So then I talk about how, what Jefferson, I talk about the, the Louisiana Purchase, the Lewis and Court, and so forth. And then my final couple of chapters, I talk about the, the, uh, the role of James Madison, the role of Madison and Jefferson embargo in the coming of the War of 1812, how in some sense that war goes so badly for a long time. The British invade Washington, D.C. They burn the Capitol building. They burn the president's mansion. The, 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 the British occupy Washington, D.C. And then uh, miraculously, miraculously almost, the British, they, they get tired of fighting. 
they had two attempts to try to defeat the Americans and, and then they lost. And so there, there's going to be a treaty at Kent. And in 18, or December 1814, a peace treaty is signed, ending the War of 1812. And then I talk about the, the role of Jean Monroe. Monroe is not is, is a quieter, not nearly as well-known person as Madison or, or uh, Jefferson. He doesn't write as well. He's not nearly as smart. He's a person of great character, and he proves to be a pretty effective president. In the midst of all this, between 1801 and 1836, John Marshall serves as Chief Justice Supreme Court. He sort of basically creates a Supreme Court. He makes the Supreme Court a co-equal branch of government. And Marshall is a person I don't like as much as I like Jefferson and Madison, but his role is incredibly important. And he does, in a series of decisions about corporations and about nationalism and so forth, Marshall creates a kind of legal environment in which the American economy is going to be able to boom. So by the end of these people's term, it all comes to together, I think, in the conclusion in the 1728-1729, when there's a big, discuss, big uh, meeting in Virginia to discuss rewriting the Constitution of Virginia. It's going to fail. And that's going to, in some sense, kind of end the Virginia dynasty. And it's a real tragedy for Virginia and a tragedy for the United States because conservative, vindictive, narrow-minded people are going to take over the control of Virginia and the control of the South, whereas Madison, Monroe, and Washington, and Jefferson had all been nationalists. So anyway, I've gone on now for too long, but you see that, I mean, these, in all the big events, the coming of the revolution, the revolution, the writing of the Constitution, the ratification of the Constitution, the formation of the government, the formation of political parties, the evolution of, evolution of the presidency, the rise of the Supreme Court, and all these important things that shape the, this nation. These seven Virginians, in their own ways, play the essential role. Hence, the title of my book, Nation Makers. Okay, Julie, I've talked too long, but I get caught up in it, and I, sorry. Well, Dr. Bowles, as always, we are all sitting here just amazed at what you have in your head. 